Hey guys, uh, week 26 for you. I got eight reviews, uh, not big, uh, not that big of an update, and a few questions. So uh, let me get right into this. This first one is uh, Beyond the Seventh Door from Intervision. Or Intervision, sorry, I always do Intervision for some reason. Yeah, this is a weird one. This is one of those movies. This was made in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, it was popular only. It was kind of a cult movie, definitely a cult movie, because it uh, played on uh, Canadian television a lot. It never had a proper DVD or Blu-ray uh, Blu release, of course not, or uh, VHS release. It's never really been released anywhere. So uh, this is the first time it's ever been released. Uh, this is an oddball movie. Uh, I think... Samurai Cop, think Halloween Night, think Dangerous Men, think The Room. This is one of these movies where it's an earnest foreign director from a different country that doesn't necessarily know the intricate ins and outs of, you know, how people act or interact with human beings. Uh, the lead actor is also, uh, I believe I want to say he's from Croatia, so he gives a super bizarre but earnest uh, and kind of sometimes just cringy performance, but it's also genuine. It's a very strange uh, movie because of that. What we have here is this uh, criminal who's just released from prison. He goes back to his old lover, and he tries to convince her that uh, let's rob her boss, who's this uh, real, uh, really rich uh, millionaire sadistic guy in a wheelchair. They end up going there to do it, and uh, the whole house is booby-trapped. Uh, they end up in this... Uh, intricate layer with all these crazy traps where they have to solve puzzles what uh what this movie has going for it is that it's earnest like i said it's not so bad it's uh you know trying to be bad it's trying to be good but it's bad so a lot of people kind of enjoy that uh style of movie but it has these really ambitious traps uh they're all homemade you can tell they're homemade uh they're definitely uh, on made on a budget but it has this nice little touch to it and they are intricate, like I said. Uh, and this whole movie was filmed in a freaking uh, water plant basement. So you got to give it up for that. You can see the hard edges, and it makes you kind of appreciate it. I will say that most of the movie is uh, just them in a couple rooms talking. It, it does wear out its welcome. The lead performance is insane. It's super weird. The dialogue is very clunky, how he delivers it. And the way they kind of shoehorn and uh, show like a sex scene and like skin and whatnot is is, is hilarious. It's, you can see what they're trying to do is like trying to make a movie that's uh, for, for a wider audience and a lot of people might get a kick out of it. It's not necessarily my thing. Sometimes these work when you have this like really uh, crazy kind of different director making something in a different country. Like I love Halloween Night. Uh, I really enjoy Samurai Cop. Uh, Dangerous Men in this, uh, I'm, 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 particularly Dangerous Men is really bad, but this one, I think it has some uh, genuine great things about it but i'm not really thrilled with the entire movie there's no gore or actual nudity to speak of there's only four actors in a whole movie and only uh, three of them have uh speaking lines and three of them actually show their face so you don't have much going on there um it's just really painful to watch at times but also also i think people can see this and appreciate it for what for that kind of a you know that they went out and they had ambition and they made a I guess a capable movie. It's not particularly great, but uh, it's presented... Uh, I believe this is one of those movies that possibly was shot on film, but uh, was edited on tape, and the tape is the only thing, because it's. A, I think it's a, you know, it, it's not great quality. It doesn't look particularly great. There's an audio commentary with uh, the lead actor and the director on here, which was uh, great to see, and it's also narrated by the guy from Exploitation, who seems to have a genuine fondness for the movie. There's also interviews with the director and actor, and this is much more interesting than the movie, how the movie actually got made, who these people are, and how they're still kicking and uh the director is definitely a bizarre kind of guy he doesn't think like other people and he has these strange beliefs he's actually a writer all this stuff is much more interesting it's a nice release uh it's uh it's one of these movies that i think in a group people will get a kick out of me watching it by myself to review i was thinking eh, this really isn't for me there's some moments like i said that are worth checking out and uh, i i appreciate the ambition i appreciate the sets but i do not appreciate the uh kind of uh just the awkwardness of it. It's just too awkward for me. Welcome to my chambers of terror, whoever you are. But of course, I know what you are. You are a thief. A burglar who has trespassed on my property to steal my famous treasure. So go ahead, get it.
That is crazy. You can now try to open the next door to continue on, or you may stay where you are and die peacefully. It, it became cult immediately. He always told me, like, Lazar, you're a very interesting guy. Blah, blah, blah. So I said, why don't you write for me something? It wasn't the happiest crew on earth. There was friction. Director of photography didn't like assistant, uh, whatever. So it was tense on the film. And I sensed that, you know, it was not kind of uh, love, love, love. But I would recommend to people that if they like these kind of puzzle movies, that, that, you know, this has some very interesting puzzles that are, you know, kind of beyond what you'd expect for a film that is, a, you know, admittingly much lower budget than something like Sleuth or Death Trap. You'll always remember meeting Ben Curry, and he always had a kind word to say. And for me, all I knew is I could get him a ton of media if I play the kitsch card. I know people won't take him serious, but he had serious ideas. I don't like it. I don't like it at all! The next one here is Blood Feast from Arrow. This also is uh, includes Scum of the Earth. These are two Herschel Gordon Lewis movies made in 1963. I'm going to say some things about Herschel Gordon Lewis that a lot of people are going to be like, eh. All right, years ago I saw Blood Feast and I never was a fan of it. I like the crappy remakes and sequels or whatever you want to call it. Blood Cult was okay. Love Blood Diner. Uh, Blood Sucking Pittsburgh. Blood Sucking Pharaohs in Pittsburgh. I enjoy. Never saw Mardi Gras Massacre, but I never was a particularly huge fan of Blood Feast. I thought that it was just more concerned about making money than making art. And I know that's the genuine concern for a lot of these movies, but there's a lot more to it. These are craftsmen, and Herschel Gordon Lewis necessarily isn't a craftsman. He's innovative as hell, but he's not a craftsman. And uh, so so when I rewatched this one, I was interested. I listened to all the features and everything, maybe appreciate a Herschel Gordon Lewis. I already did appreciate him. I understand what he did for the genre. He made pretty much the first gore film with uh, Blood Feast, one of the first gore films, if not the first. And uh, he was always transgressive, but he never felt dangerous, if that makes sense. When you watch somebody like uh, a Van Beber or even modern-day James Bell, they seem dangerous. Like, there's danger in the movies. And when I want my transgressive cinema that pushes envelopes, that changes the cinema landscape, I kind of want it to be dangerous. I don't know. That's just something I prefer. Uh, on here is a bunch of features with Herschel Gordon Lewis. And I like the guy. I, I love listening to him talk about film and how film is made and how he che cheaply got things done. But I think that this is almost like a case of that he's more concerned about getting the picture done and making money than actually making art. And I can see that. And it's just so cheap and it's so poorly acted and it's just ludicrous. The plot is ludicrous. It's just a poorly put together movie. It always has been. And that's part of the charm for a lot of people. For me, it's not particularly something I like. Um, the gore is uh, ridiculous. It's so tame by today's standards, but back then I imagine it was very graphic for people. They use real innards and things like that. You can spot uh, some nudity here and there, uh, but I don't think it was supposed to be intentional, you know, people in bathtubs. There's a lot of pretty girls in it. The acting's pretty horrendous for the most part. There's a lot of funny scenes in that, just the way the camera is framed, like there'll be cuts right into the same dialogue. It doesn't cut away to anything. Just so cheap. So damn cheap. And uh, like I said, it's charming that he made it, and it's charming that it's that cheap, but I, you can't really ask me to like it, because uh, I, I just I think it's bad. I know that uh, I, that's why I never watched any of his other movies. He's, he's a, kind of a, a blank spot for me, because I never liked what I saw. Um, saying that, I know that he would go on to do like other films like 2001 Maniacs and Color Me Blood Red, and I had the, the set, and I'm probably going to dig into that eventually, and I'm sure I'll like some of them, I, as he probably gets better as he progresses with the gore splatter films. Uh, the other movie on here, Scum of the Earth, I actually like better. It's a black and white. It's his last black and white film, also made in 63. uses a bunch of the same cast here and there. Um, this is supposed to be the first Ruffy. 
And uh, I'll tell you what, it's not very rough, but for 63, I'm sure it was. We have this group of kind of sleazy photographers, real sleazy, and they blackmail women into f being nude in shots and all sorts of things. And of course, it, it escalates and there's uh, you know some action at the very end. This one, I think, is a better movie. Uh, I think it's put together better. I think the dialogue's better. Everything about it, I think, is better. I think that he was probably more comfortable doing this kind of stuff, to be honest, at this point, uh, because uh, Blood Feast was his first gore film. He had already done uh, these kind of nudie-cutie things, or nudie-cutie and all those kind of uh, naked uh, uh, colonist movies, nude colonist movies. This one, I think, is uh, a little bit better. Not perfect, not great. Uh, it still suffers from the same cheap problems and everything. But uh, I like listening to him and David Freeman talk about their movies and uh, the release has tons of that uh, like I said audio commentary and interviews with other people that love it and I, I understand why they love it it's just not something that's really for me I uh, appreciate the hell out of Herschel Gordon Lewis for what he did for the horror genre it's just that I don't like what I've seen and I've, I, I didn't like what I've seen so much that I've avoided a lot of his other titles ladies and gentlemen you're about to witness some scenes from the next attraction to play this theater this picture, truly one of the most unusual ever filmed, contains scenes which under no circumstances should be viewed by anyone with a heart condition or anyone who is easily upset. We urgently recommend that if you are such a person or the parent of a young or impressionable child now in attendance, that you and the child leave the auditorium for the next 90 seconds. you kids make me sick. You act like little Miss Muffet, and down inside you're dirty. Do you hear me? Dirty. You're greedy and self-centered and think you can get away with anything. And you're no better than the girl who sells herself to a man. You're worse because you're a hypocrite. And now little Miss Muffet is in trouble, and she's all outraged virtue. Well, you listen, and you listen well. You're damaged merchandise, and this is a fire sale. And you walk out of here, and your reputation won't be worth 15 cents. You'll do as I tell you. Do you hear? You'll do as I tell you. Next one here from Arrow.
I'm gonna follow this uh, bad arrow movie up with a good arrow. That's bad release. It's just not something I like. This is shock treatment uh, by the film, the creators of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. And any huge fan of this movie will get upset if you call it a sequel because it's not a sequel. It's not a prequel. It's an equal. That's kind of uh, I think one of the taglines for it. But shock treatment was made in 79, 80, released in 80, and it's a sequel to the Rocky Horror Picture Show. Again, I'm gonna say something that's probably controversial. I'm not the hugest fan of the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I think it's all right. I think it's cool. I think that uh, it deserves its cult status, and I think it's important. But uh, I don't love it. I like it. I don't love it. Uh, shock treatment. I love. Uh, I saw this one uh, a long time ago, probably a few years ago, not a long time ago. But I don't know, five, six years ago. I watched it and I liked it. I was like, that was weird. I enjoyed it. So uh, when I saw that uh, uh, Arrow's reason, I was interested. And I also hear the soundtrack a bunch of times. Person I live with plays it all the time. So the songs get stuck in your head, and you start to realize how freaking catchy and how smart they are. And uh, that's one thing about Shock Treatment. It is a very intelligent movie. It's uh, it's way ahead of its time. Uh, the sets are amazing. The acting is amazing. The singing is amazing. All the stuff they do in the movie is amazing. And uh, you don't realize that, I don't think, the first time you see it. I think you, this is one of those movies that uh, you want to rewatch. And on rewatch, I... I love the hell out of it. I was really, really surprised. This is a really nice release to it. It looks great. It sounds freaking great. It comes with the CD on here. Shock treatment. How do I explain this? If anybody's familiar with the Rocky Horror Picture Show, it has the characters of uh, Janet and uh, Brad, and now they're not necessarily in the same situation. They go back to their hometown, or they're in their hometown, and they realize that this whole big uh, TV network had taken over. Everything's a reality show. This is 1980, uh, and everything's about consumerism. Everybody's brainwashed. Everybody wants to be popular. It's a movie about how easy it is to just kind of sell out when they when they when you get the chance to be have fame or be popular. Uh, it's about brainwashing, and uh, the dance dances in here, and the songs are perfect uh, from all of them. From uh, they, and they're so satirical. There's so many, so much great satire in here. Uh, the father, who's just supposed to be this masculine character, sings this song, "I'm a man," and it's it just hilarious because it just shows, uh, you know, all these things are supposed to be super manly, and it's just making fun of him at the same time, but he's also dead serious when he's doing it. Lots of good stuff like that. And the very end of the movie is fairly dark for what it is, although you'll see it in a zany kind of light, but it is dark, and it is, uh, it's ridiculous. But the, the I love the songs. I listen to the soundtrack at work a couple times. Gets stuck in your head, too. Uh, it's just a really great, well-put-together disc for a really underrated cult movie. I know that Rocky Horror's got this huge cult, and it probably deserves it. I don't see it. But I wish Shock Treatment had that same cult because I think it deserves it. It has uh, Riff Raff in here. Uh, what is it? Richard O'Brien. And the three three of the bunch of the people from Rocky Horror. But instead of, uh, you know, Susan Sarandon, it's uh, Jessica Harper. And uh, if, if anybody's seen Jessica Harper or heard her sing, within the first, like, 30 seconds, if you're not madly in love with her, you're probably dead. I know, you know, she's perfect. She's from Suspiria and Phantom of Paradise and The Victors. Um, the guy who plays replaces Brad, I think this is a tremendous job too. Great singing voice. Uh, Tim Curry's not in here. That, that kind of hurts the movie a little bit, but no Tim Curry and Meatloaf, and that's probably why a lot of people are disappointed. But I like the songs better. Uh, I think it's a great movie. I think it's zany. I think it's weird. I think it's highly memorable, and I think the lighting is great. And uh, the idea that it's a reality show and all these people are getting brainwashed in 1980 is so ahead of its time. It resonates so much today. I think that uh, Shock Treatment is a freaking masterpiece. I'm going to say it, you know? But, hey, check out the Arrow video. Brad will learn how to care in a surgical chair. Bitching in the kitchen or crying in the bedroom all night. I'd just like to say that I hope you enjoy it. I hope that um, you like the music, most of all. Jim Sharman showed that to Andrew Lloyd Webber and gave him the idea to do The Phantom. She's still gorgeous. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, basically the transformation that's going to happen in just a few moments when they say that we can make you into a superstar. Uh, she bought all the, went to all the thrift shops to buy all the clothes for the audience. I have to tell you that when it comes to the music of Shock Treatment, I've listened to the music of Shock Treatment more than I listened to the music of Rocky Horror. What were you doing eight years ago? The Rocky uh, Horror Show. <laughs> What's the Rocky Horror Show? What's the Rocky Horror Show? Who is that guy? And uh, I have, I've had a long conversation with Richard O'Brien about this, about how it started as a sequel to Rocky Horror, and it started... You can't believe anything he says. Okay, right? fine. And tolerance for the ethnic races. Trust me. 
I'm a doctor. <laughs> Strapless, backless, classical, little black dress. Well, first you go rip, rip, rip. Then you go snip, snip, snip. Then you whip it a zip, zip, zip. I split it up to the hip, hip, hip. And as you strip, strip, strip. You shiver and quiver. For that soft caress as you slip, slip, slip. Into that little black dress. <laughs> The next one here is Cannibal Cop. Yeah, that's right. Donald Farmer's Cannibal Cop. I was interested in this because Donald Farmer's used to as independent director. has been doing movies for like 20, 30 years. He did Vampire Cop, which I reviewed. Uh, Demon Queen, Scream Dream, uh, Savage Vengeance. So, yeah, he, he makes these really low-budget, like, cheesy, uh, full of, uh, you know, a lot of technical air movies. This one had Ronnie Jonah and Jason Crow in it, who I, uh, I love. They're, they're really nice people. They're cool people. I know him. So I was interested in checking it out. Uh, cannibal cop follows the story of this crooked, uh, dickhead cop, Jason Crow, who gets bit by the zombie who was brought back by voodoo from someone he did wrong. It kind of sounds a lot like zombie cop, you know, those kind of movies, you know, anything that has cop in it at the end is usually pretty bad, but it sounds a lot like Zombie Cop or, or Vampire Cop, which is a previous movie he had. But uh, Jason Crowe deals with this cannibal curse by going around biting and eating people. He's not a good guy. This uh, girl wants to show that there's this huge, this woman wants to show and break into the news industry and show that there's these crooked cops everywhere and, you know, show people that cops are bad. Cops are no good. They beat up people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Ronnie Jonah plays this uh, reporter, this kind of head reporter, and uh, she's a hot shot. She doesn't want anything to do with her. Uh, of course, they all kind of intermingle, and uh, it's up to this voodoo priest to stop who brought the cannibal cop on accident to stop him. It's it's a really goofy movie. Uh, the bite effects after the special effects are pretty good. There's some like uh, makeup in here where they just throw green on the guy's face, and he's supposed to be a zombie. Almost all the stuff shot shot in the street, probably without. It's all gorilla probably style. Uh, the sound issues are pretty bad. You hear. <laughs> And I can understand, like, a first movie, you know, I had that problem with uh, Slimy Little Bastards. But this is, like, Donald Farmer's, like, probably 30th movie. So I don't know if they're, the sound issues go, uh, you know, just, on, you know, being lazy or probably actually some real hard problems. I'm not sure what happened, but I know that I'm hearing that. So there's no ADR. There's no uh, separate captured sound. And it sounds pretty rough. It is distracting. Uh, the acting, besides from the leads like Ronnie Jonah and Jason Crow and uh, Megan Hunt, and a couple others do really well. And then the acting range is some of these side characters are just bad. And I mean, or it could just be the dialogue. It, it's a fairly uh, ridiculous movie by premise and plot. So you can't take it too seriously, but it is a failure in a lot of ways, the sound. And it it's just not great special effects. The story's not great. It, it's just not particularly something I enjoyed. Uh, it's a little too uh, cheap for me. And I, I love cheap movies, like I said. Some cheap movies. There's going to be a cheap movie coming down the line in this video that I absolutely adore. I know it was a much bigger movie, and it, it probably costs a lot more. But it's still cheap, and I love it for its cheapness. This one I don't love for its cheapness because it's just too has too many technical issues. And it's just not... It's story and a lot of the other stuff don't overcome that to make it anything special. There's a retrospective on here, which is basically Farmer talking about all the movies he did. The Farmer, again, has a endless knowledge of film. I mean, uh, has an endless film knowledge. Uh, he talks about all the movies he did. So that's a nice refresher if you've seen a lot of his movies. Uh, Cannibal Hookers is one of them as well. Uh, and then there's a commentary on here. Uh, on the disc. Uh, not something I would really recommend, but if you like this kind of low-budget stuff, then I would check it out. He's out there, and he's hungry. Real hungry. This might be your first cannibal cop. He's cleaning up the streets, one bite at a time. Don't get in his way, or you're on the menu. <laughs> cannibal cop. He takes a bite out of crime. 
next one here is uh, Pa Nigre. I think it's Pa Nigre. Uh, this is actually by the director of um, In a Glass Cage, which is an infamous movie. It has a huge, it has a cult following. Cult Epics released it. It's a really disturbing movie. A lot of people put it on like super disturbing mo movie list, but it, it's an art film. And uh, that's probably what uh, gives it a little bit more weight than a lot of your average disturbing movies. And Pa Nigra is that as well. It is a, definitely an art film. It's a coming-of-age story that follows this boy in a uh, post-war in uh, kind of this third-world country. And it shows uh, his father and mother. And uh, they they seem like good people at first. And then as, as the story goes on, all these complexities, uh, there's this weird uh, mythology in there about this character that's supposed to live in this cave. And there's a murder that takes place, and everybody blames that person. But it's, it's such a strange movie at first it starts off like I said with this kid having this idea of his parents and by the end of the movie it's completely torn it's completely different and uh, this huge complex uh, you know criminal past happens that divulges a lot of characters for people who they aren't or people who you didn't think they are and who they actually are um, there's uh, this weird sexuality with it with his cousin who lo loses his uh, missing hand from a bomb going off near her house so we have that aspect in here and it it's uncomfortable that's probably why this movie's never been released in the states to my knowledge this is a uh, import disc here uh and and there's this real uh awkward like it's not awkward it, it feels real but it feels very uncomfortable with his uh cousin who they're very young and uh, they have this weird sexual moment in the woods and there's also this uh group of uh I want to say they're lepers, but they call them disease, and they're kind of in this monastery. They don't ever say what they are, but I imagine it's leprosy, uh, where one of them bathes nude, and the boy seems interested in watching the person bathe, and it, it's just weird sexuality that he has with this character. And there, there's like this a uh, lot of homophobic characters in the movie, and it plays into it. Uh, it's it's like I said, it's really well made, it's really well acted, and it will punch you in the freaking stomach. Uh, a lot of the descriptions say it's about somebody who's, you know, realizing the monster in themselves, and that's exactly what it is, realizing the world's not a perfect place. It, like I said, coming in the age story, realizing that some things work differently and uh, not as, as all as it seems. It has great locations. I love the time place, uh, time frame it takes place. Uh, it's a, it's a beautiful movie, but also really gut-wrenching and real and dramatic and intensely sad and disturbing in a lot of ways as well i would really recommend checking it out especially if you like in a glass cage it, it is similar in a lot of ways it, it it does these things without like focusing on them like they're an ex extreme movie it's just these things happen and they're horrific or these things happen and they're uncomfortable or these things happen and they're sexual and they probably with these characters it shouldn't be happening but it just happens and it's a matter of fact kind of thing uh there's a lot of politics in here as well and the complexities of the situation uh you know are really well done i'd really recommend that one there's a lot of good relationships in this movie
The next one here from Vestron is Slaughter High. And this isn't even the cheap low-budget movie I was talking about that I love, but it is cheap and low-budget, and I love the hell out of it. Yeah, Slaughter High, this was, I believe, made in 86. It's it's one of the most infamous kind of slasher movies. Everybody wanted to see it on Blu-ray, and I'm glad it got released on Blu-ray. Yeah, if you guys don't know the story of uh, Slaughter High, it follows uh, a group of uh, bullies that pick on this guy named Marty, and through a horrible accident, they scar the hell out of him. Ten years later, there's a high school reunion where they're all invited, and they come back to the school, and they're the only ones left. The school looks shut down, and of course, they start getting picked off. It's not a big mystery who's doing it. We all know who's doing it. There's no twist. It's and, and what happens is a bunch of goofy characters that are assholes uh, getting killed by by ridiculous ways, including acid beer, acid bath, um, what are some, uh, motor, uh, lots of great scenes, and this movie has a lot of great gore effects, a lot of good kills, uh, but it's really goofy too, especially in the beginning, because all of them are way too old to be playing high schoolers, and they all play the same characters. And it is fairly mean-spirited. Some of the people are bullies in the beginning, but they don't necessarily deserve to die or have what happens to them happen to them. They're not monsters. Not all of them. Uh, Carolyn Monroe's in here, a little bit older than the rest of them. She's in, you know, Maniac and a bunch of other Hammer movies and stuff. Uh, great actress. And you know what? I know the acting is a bit cheesy, but I don't think it's bad. And I think it's actually a little bit better than a lot of people would remember. The gore effects also hold up really well. They are cheap, but they hold over, and especially the acid beer. I remember seeing that. And this movie was one of those movies that, when I first saw it years ago, it just blew my mind on VHS. I was like, oh my god, on the desk. I always thought it was more gnarly than it probably actually was. But it's still fairly gnarly for what it is, a slasher movie, like I said. Um... I love the hell out of it. Uh, the music in here is by Harry Manfredini, and I didn't even know that when I was rewatching it. And I was hearing, I was like, man, a lot of these cues sound just like Friday the freaking 13th. And uh, when I saw it, I was like, oh, he did the sound. They talk about in the commentary. He did the music. They talk about in the commentary. But uh, it's one of my favorite slasher movies, only because the setup is so... Uh it's so rewarding. I love revenge movies, and that's exactly what it is. Everybody knows that the guy who played Marty, the nerd who uh, gets uh, hurt in the beginning... Uh, killed himself shortly after the movie was complete, which is a tragedy. Uh, and a lot of people say, it's because the movie drove him mad. That, and they talk about that in the commentary. That's nonsense. Uh, there is a gratuitous male nude scene in the very beginning where uh, the prank that they play on him, uh, you see everything. And they give him a swirly, and they show him up, and butt crack and all is in there. <laughs> That's just not something they would typically do. This is by uh, British directors, British filmmakers who did this, three directors. All of them are included on the disc. Two do a commentary, Michael Felsher. That's really great. They laugh about it. They reminisce. They make jokes about the whole movie. And there's another interview with the other guy on here. Kelly Monroe is an interview. The disc is a, is a really nice... Uh, release. They do a lot of extras on here that uh, were I don't think previously released before. I'm not sure what the Arrow DVD had. Uh, the transfer doesn't look great. A lot of the blacks look really rough, I think. But it's the best it's ever looked and uh, it is a low-budget 86 slasher movie, so I'm not going to complain too much. I'm just happy that we actually got it. Uh, love the music. Uh, the original title is April Fool's Day, which is a, a much better title because he's picking all these people off on April Fool's Day. They played the original pranks on April Fool's. But uh, love the hell out of it. I think the acting and the characters are better than a lot of the modern slashers now. Um, they may be stereotypes, but they're not so overly for stereotypes today now. Everybody's got to be like, I'm the jock, and let you know they're the jock 67 times in a movie because it's funny. Not really. But uh, yeah, love Slaughter High. I really check it out. If you guys like slasher movies and you haven't seen it, what are you doing? What are you doing with your lives except not wasting them like me? Go watch Slaughter High. Can't go in there. Come on now, lover boy's not frightened, is he? I'm sorry, Marty. We didn't mean to. Now listen, kid, it's a big break for you. I'd rather go to my crummy class reunion than do that picture. Reminds me of prom night. Marty into the showers, none of this would have happened. There's gotta be a way out.
trying to do? Kill us? <laughs> The next one here is directed by Bill Heinzman in the late 80s. This is Flesh Eater. I reviewed Majorettes a little bit ago. He directed that one too in 86. And uh, Flesh Eater is one of my uh, favorite movies. It's been in my rotation of watch movies I would just watch all the time for like 15, 16 years, maybe 17 years. Almost damn near a de 20 years, two decades, 18 years. I think I've been watching this movie in regular rotation. I had it on the original VHS for Magnum, Revenge of the Living Zombies, I believe. It was, I think it was called that. But uh, what we have here is a completely shameless kind of rip off of Night of the Living Dead. And that's why I love it, because it's shot in Pittsburgh or in the Pennsylvania area with Bill Heinzman and, you know, some of the cast from, uh, well, a couple you'll notice from uh, Night of the Living Dead. So I'm a sucker for that. It has that Pittsburgh feel. has that fall feel. has that just ridiculously fun, uh, gory zombie movie thing going on. Uh, this farmer accidentally unleashes pure evil in Bill Heinzman, who's the original Graveyard Cemetery zombie. He's also the director of this movie, and he also pretty much plays the same character, but now he's a little bit stronger and more supernatural. Um, he just finds this thing in the ground, and like an idiot... He uh, takes the stump out, and then he takes this weird pentagram off. Then he opens the coffin, breaks the chain. It's like, man, if somebody took the time to do this much to hide this body, why are you going to keep... Well, just don't open. Leave it alone. And, uh, of course, he unleashes pure evil on Halloween night. And uh, Bill Heinzman, the zombie creature, goes around and spreading the zombies. And all the zombies uh, first attack all these kids, and the kids are running through. They go into town. Halloween parties. They start getting picked off. Rick Bullock is in this, too, from Gorgasm. Uh, not the newer one. The older Gorgasm by Hugh Gallagher. And Final Interview. He's in that as well. He pops up in here. Uh, Vince, uh, the, the character from Vince from Night of the Living Dead, pops up in here again. The guy who accidentally shoots Ben at the end. Uh, doing something similar. But yeah, the gore effects are insane. It is completely gratuitous in nudity as well. It's shameless in that, in that as well. The gore effects are really fun, really great. And there's, they're abundant. The zombies look, you know, in flannels. They look like uh, a cross between Night and Dawn of the Dead. I love them. Um... And like I said, it, there's gratuitous nudity in here too as well. Like Heinzman attacks this girl who just got out of the shower. And he's, at one point it looks like he cups her boob, which uh, it, it, I was like, hmm, that's a little odd. Did you grab her boob? And then you realize he has to take the towel off. But it, it's kind of, uh, it looks worse than it probably is. But uh, it's a super fun movie. It's like I said, shameless. Some of the acting ranges, some's bad, some's good. And it's mean as hell. Like the people, I feel bad for the people when they die. And I don't typically say that. I feel bad for everybody that gets killed in here. There's this poor cop who gets killed, and he gets on the, the radio, and he's yelling at the dispatcher, and <laughs> you just feel like, man, poor guy. And uh, you know what's funny, as hokey and cheesy as it is, I think the people act a little bit more natural than they would in a lot of other horror movies. My favorite scene in the movie, it's always been my favorite scene in the movie. Well, maybe not my favorite. Besides the cartoon animation of Bill Heinzman biting the screen, I love that. But there's this character, they're picking off the zombies in true Romero fashion, even though it's not Romero. And uh, these uh, these group of hunters, and it's Halloween, the day after Halloween, and he goes in the house to clear this house out, and he looks over down at him. I've talked about this before. He looks down, sees a candy bar. You know what he does? He pockets the candy bar. He's probably been out all night hunting zombies, and he's hungry. But, uh, yeah, it's just a movie I love. Uh, if you like gore, if you like gratuitous nudity, if you like Halloween fun, if you like a fall feeling, if you like Heinzman as the graveyard zombie running around biting people, that's all I can say. The music's great, too. I love it. The picture quality on the Blu-ray is not perfect. It's not as good as the Majorettes. I think they did a better job with that, but this is Shriek Show, older Blu-ray. But I love the movie. What can I say? <laughs> Come on, man, those things are right behind us. It's too late. Go find someplace else to hide. Oh, you bastard. Get 
with Deputy Garrett. What are we looking for? Yeah, Sarah. What are these things? They're dead things. <laughs> one is the border with this is a german import that has jack nicholson harvey keitel and warren oates uh i just heard about this movie from 80s all over and i was interested because you know harvey keitel jack nicholson warren oates this might have been warren oates last movie but uh yeah we follow jack nicholson who's a border patrol officer in uh california his wife wants to move back to texas with her sister and her husband so they convince him to finally do it jack nicholson hates his job he's miserable at doing it and he should be if you see what he does he anybody would be he goes to texas and uh he gets paid more his wife starts spending a lot of money the both her, his wife and her sister are both very materialistic and that's why kind of harvey Keitel and jack nicholson seemingly need money uh and well they need money of course harvey Keitel is crooked and it's kind of hard like the movie tries to set up like their material materialism i don't know what's going on up there but their materialism is what you know, sets these guys to become crooked. And that necessarily doesn't work in the movie. But Jack, Nichol gets, Jack Nicholson gets thrown in this world of, you know, corrupt border patrol officers. And he uh, starts kind of befriending this uh, young girl who has this baby with her and her little brother. He starts feeling sorry for him. And he starts to dig deep into this uh, murder. And he realizes that this ties back to the border patrol. And he has a line. The whole movie's about lines and about, you know, your soul and whatnot. And, you know, losing it and becoming like a certain kind of man, you know. The trailer does a really good job at that. It says the line you cross is the border and it, the border and yourself and whatnot. I love how they set that up. And that's what happens here. There's moments of comedy with Jack Nicholson, especially during a, a dinner, kind of a, bar, a backyard barbecue they have where he, he grabs, the, there's a food fight that breaks out. He's burning these shish kebabs and he throws the grill in the, in the pool. That's great. Uh, I think Warren Oates is underutilized in here. And another thing about the movie is Roy, Roy Corder did the music, and it's perfect. The music's great in here, a lot of singing, and that it ties directly into the movie. Uh, the the girl that Jack Nicholson wants to help has a really sympathetic thing going on with her. So many bad things happen to her, you, you, you're you rooting for. And the bad guys in the movie you absolutely hate. A couple of them you want to kill yourself. Uh, and when people die in this movie, they don't just do a typical shoot. It, it's almost like they go to these elaborate extremities to kill people and a couple of my i said oh my god i can't believe that just happened in this movie it doesn't feel like it should be in this movie there's two of them that for in particular but uh it, it's a little long for my taste and like i said the whole idea that the materialism with them kind of pushing them forward forward to have to be crooked and what his wife does is almost comical the way they do it but uh, there's some serious moments as well it's a good movie i'd recommend it good music good performances especially by jack nicholson i think he he does a great job harvey Keitel is always good warren Oates is always good uh there's some like recognizable faces in here that pop up too the dad from american history x he was also in a, a tv show i can't remember what he was in and uh the heavy set guy from night of the scarecrow and prince of darkness are both border patrol cops other people you'll recognize too I can't really pinpoint their names off the top of my head. But uh, it, it's a solid movie uh, with a really good performance and a, and a good message. And you know what? It resonates today. There's a lot of stuff to talk about the border and illegal immigrants and whatnot. This this movie, uh, you know, uh, paints the uh, a lot of the illegals as, uh, you know, um, sympathetic characters, especially, you know, the, the, the girl with her, the baby. Although they do like uh, paint the picture, you know, a lot of uh, drug cartels and drug drug pushing and stuff in there too. It's an interesting movie, and uh, I wish they were still making interesting movies like this. Maybe I'm just being a, a, a Debbie Downer, but I don't think they're as interesting as this stuff. This is run of the mill movie with Jack Nicholson, 1981, and it just has all this stuff going on there. And it's not forced; it's not shoved down your throat. It's just there, and I like that. I ain't in this for murder. You hear me? No way that I'm in this for murder. There's some real big money on the table. Smart man, he's gonna play his cards right tight up against his chest. You're killing drivers. Don't tell me I don't know what I'm talking about, because if I don't know what I'm talking about, where's the driver you took in there today? See this line? This line right here I don't cross. This line right here. Within every man, there are two men. There's times when I feel like there's a whole other person in there. It just isn't the Charlie Smith that I married. One who does what he's told to. Game's a little different around here. There's some real big money on the table. One who does what he has to. 
I don't care about your money. Well, you your life get... is gonna be fine. Listen, you're not ever getting involved murder. You understand what I'm saying to you? <laughs> Within every man, there is a difference. No, 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 senora. You don't owe me anything. Between what he sees is wrong. But I just left him on the other side with Adam's apple all over his chest. And what he knows is right. Hold it right there. What do you want, boy? Now look for that kid you took off the truck. Within every man, there is a distance. I want to feel good about something sometime. Between how far he's come. We take care of business, Charlie. That's all we do. We take care of business. And how far he'll go. See this line? This line right here I don't cross. This line right here. Within every man, there is a border. I need to buy a gun. Once he crosses it, there's no going back. How you doing, Charlie? Charlie's never been better, Red. Jack Nicholson. The border. It divided the land. It divided the man. Uh, I guess we'll get into the old contest for, uh, what was it for? I can't remember. <laughs> Because <laughs> I'm a jerk. But I'll remember. You guys know what it's for. It's upstairs. I forgot to grab it. I am a sloppy mess today. Yeah, I'm out of Ziploc baggies, too. Look at this. Who won? John Wilhelm. There you go, buddy. All right. Now it's time for the new contest. You guys know you got to do three things. Uh, like the Screaming Toilet Facebook page. Uh, leave a comment on... Uh, I mean, leave a comment on the Screaming Toilet page. You'll see it. The link below. And uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you want to do a fourth thing, that would be great. Give me some uh, recommendation on how to improve the channel, on how to improve the videos. Or just say, hey, can you review this? Give me a, a word of feedback. Positive, negative, anything. Just let me know if I can do anything better. But you will win a copy, a DVD copy of Evil Ed. It's the unrated edition and a DVD copy of Unhinged. I noticed a barcode left uh, some weird stain on there on the back. These are both movies I've upgraded the Blu-ray or already have a second copy. But uh, let's get into the questions. John Wilhelm, question for you, favorite Lee Van Cleef movie? Probably uh, for a few dollars more. Uh, that's probably the one I like best. Or uh, The Big Gun Down. That's one of them. He's good in that too. He's also Escape from New York. But I'm going to go with for a few dollars more. Nick, do you enjoy French horror films? Yes, I do. Uh... He gives examples and uh, a bunch of them. You know, some of these movies I've seen, you know, I've seen Brotherhood of the Wolf. I like that. I love Inside. I think I talked about these before. Martyrs, Inside. High Tension, I think, is great until the ending. I think it's terrible. I don't care how damn crazy you are. You can't do that. Uh, what else? I uh, Not a big fan of Frontiers, some of the bigger ones. There's a, a French movie I reviewed a while ago about this couple. These uh, young couple that are on the run and they get picked up by this uh, weird guy in the woods and he... It's a Hansel and Gretel retelling. That's a good one, too. I can't think of the name. Uh, Tony of the Dead. I guess my question would have to be, out of all the movies in your collection, which are top three you watched? Or watched the most by me? You know, I watch Return of the Living Dead a lot. That's one of the go-to movies I put in, and I just watch it. Uh, out of three, though, three? Uh, Return of the Living Dead, Day of the Dead, those are favorites. Uh, let me think of some more that I just put in and watch all the time. Uh, I used to watch Dirty Work all the time on DVD. Put that in and just have some laughs. So I'll go with those three. Uh, if you don't want to answer, what is the, what is one way that you would want to see someone die in a movie that may or may not, to your knowledge, has ever been done before? I got a whole idea for a movie. I want a movie, a slasher movie, to take place in a factory. I know people are like, well, they did that with Intruder, kind of, in like the grocery store. But if anybody's ever worked in a factory and ever seen a factory injury or just know all the machinery and heavy machinery in there, there's so many accidents. There are so many ways a killer could mess somebody up in there. So many different machines. Hand in a proctor, hand in a press, hand, head in a saw. You could flatten guys. You could cut them in half. You could twist their arm into like goo. You could mess people up. Slasher in a factory. Matthew L. Bushwell, my question for you is if you could get a good sequel to any horror movie that doesn't already have sequels, what would it be? He would choose It Follows an Event Horizon. Those are cool uh, ideas. I would go with Neon Maniacs because, I mean, it's not particularly great. And I think I love it, so I want to see more of it. I don't think that there would be this huge outrage. I think there would be confusion. I don't know if you'd ever get the money for it, but I'd love to see a sequel because that movie set up all these different monsters and uh, 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 army of slashers, like kind of setting up that this is the reason for slashers all over the place. Maybe a precursor to Cabin in the Woods, but I don't know. I'm just kidding about that. But Neon Maniacs is one I'd like to see. Christopher Dallier, favorite Asian horror film? Favorite Asian horror film? Huh. Asian. Uh, it's going to have to be one of the uh, Korean or Cat 3 titles. 
I don't know if Cat 3 count, like Untold Story and Ebola Syndrome. Those are not necessarily horror movies. They're more like cry movies, but they're so twisted. A lot of people throw them in the horror category. Uh, let's go with something. Uh, let's just go with I Am Hero, Train to Basan, or ones that are stuck in my head. But Batter Oil, if it counts. It's not, I don't know if it's horror, but it's Batter Oil if i got to count that. I think that's all the questions. I will get into the update. Not much here to go on. I actually have three bootlegs, and I'm not proud of one of the bootlegs. I, I will admit, I tried to order this. My PayPal froze, and it would not go through. So if it is ever, ever put out again anywhere, I will buy it. I, it's a bootleg of the Cabal Cut. I didn't bootleg it myself, but I had to buy it. And uh, I did watch it. I, I enjoyed it. And if, uh, if it ever gets released, I'm buying it again if they put it back up. It's just that something... I, my PayPal froze and I was, I had to see it. I just had to, and I didn't want to download it and I didn't want to download it myself, but I'll, it's the point where I've ever released again, I'm buying it, but, uh, I enjoyed it. I'd like to get in depth. I bought the, I have the director's cut. I have the big chunks that I bought that movie so many freaking times. I still feel bad about that, but I had to have it and I enjoyed it. Uh, and I got a couple bootlegs made. If these are ever released on Blu-ray, I'm buying them. I already have them on DVDs, but I got a brain scan which I'm excited to see in HD, which I enjoy that movie, and uh, Body Parts, which I've never seen at all with Jeff Fahey. It's a pretty cool. Uh, and I got a double feature of Bonnie's Kids and Centerfold Girls. It was on sale from Dark Sky, or is this Gorgon? It's Gorgon. Yeah, but I, I don't. I see Centerfold Girls. I remember it being fairly decent. But yeah, uh, that's all I got. Not too much on the update. But I appreciate you guys watching, and as always, thanks for everything, and have a good one.